whether an awful lot of the very poor people. Yeah. Okay, so pockets of wealth and then... And the okay, so there, there's, uh, there's general agreement on that sentiment. And so that's also my, that was my prior when I went into this research. We're going we're gonna to find a couple of really rich folk and then the rest will all be desperately poor. Um, and uh, uh, this is very similar to what's been written at the time, actually. And so someone quite famous, Adam Smith, actually wrote quite a lot about the Cape. If you read his Wealth of Nations, he's basically no one typically reads the full book. But nowadays, you don't have to read the book. You can just kind of control F and search for, um, for Cape. And you'll find, actually, quite a lot of co uh, quotes about the Cape Colony. And there's one quote, for example, perhaps the worst of all governments of any country, whatever, is referring to the Dutch East India Company ruling a a colony, basically, so the Cape is obviously unique in the sense that it's governed by a company. He says this is the worst form of any government. Um, it's not able to stop altogether the progress of these colonies, primarily referring to the Cape, though it rendered it more slow and languid. So he's basically saying if you are governed by a company, uh, then your progress will be slower and more languid than other other forms of government where you have representative government or a democracy or all kinds of other things. Uh, which is interesting, I mean, I think the Cape, you know, one of the points I want to make uh, in future perhaps is, is that the Cape is really interesting to study because it's governed by a company. And I can imagine that in the future we would have again territories that are governed by companies. We've had it often in the past, even in Africa, colonial Africa, there were many companies that were set up governing territories. But if we are now starting to explore space, you can imagine you know, SpaceX you know, governing certain parts, and that would become an interesting model to also follow. So there's, there's other kind of, kind of tentacles that, that go into beyond economic history. But I wanted to explore kind of Adam Smith's idea. It's not only Adam Smith, it's all the historians that you've read. So here are some of the quotes. The Cape was a social and economic backwater. These are from the most famous and seminal texts, right? So, social and economic backwater. More of a static than a progressing community. A slave-based subsistence economy that advanced with almost extreme slowness. And then, kind of very recently, South Africa was a sleepy colonial backwater whose unpromising landscape was seemingly devoid of economic potential, right? So, the general consensus, at least kind of at the macro level for the Cape economy, the 18th century Cape, is that it's like a that poor place and there's no potential. So that's the least, the kind of the last place you want to end up. Um, and then for you know for a scholar, you read all of this and you think, well, okay, this is, seems to be pretty solid consensus that, that this is this is what the Cape was. And then you find this kind of quote by uh, Peter van Dijk and, and Robert Ross in, in 1987 in in actually an unpublished manuscript. Uh, it's kind of published, but it's not a easily accessible source, and they say the backwardness, they, they do all this analysis on aggregate, uh, in the, uh, not in the interest, aggregate tax censuses, the Opgaf from it, um, and they kind of end the paper, the monograph, with the backwardness of the colony at the end of the 18th century has yet to be fully challenged, or indeed fully investigated. Well, that's exactly what you want as a prospective PhD student, right? So you want, no one has tested this. So, so let's do this. And fortunately, when I started, it was a couple of years after this big project to transcribe the ProBets, ProBet Inventories. Um, and so I didn't need to go to the archives to actually go through all 2,800 or whatever ProBets. I could just use these PDFs. I suggest it still took quite a lot of time to, to, to analyze that, but, um, but I, could, I could do that. So that's what I, that's what I did for the PhD, and I'll, I'll explain that now. Why does this matter, though? So, I mean, I, I don't need to convince you that it's important because you care about history, right? But a lot of people don't care about history, so why do we care about how affluent? Why do I, I, have to, I have to convince my economics colleagues that this is interesting, right? They, they don't care about the, the past, um, but I need to tell them why this is interesting. And so, partly why it's interesting is because it shapes our perception about today. So here's two historians. Right, from two very distinct ideological fields. The one is a F.R. van Jarsfeld, Afrikaner nationalist historian of the 20th century. And that is a spot kind of representing English liberal historians. Right? So they also believe the Cape is poor, and it kind of shapes their worldview. So they explain, firstly, F.R. van Jarsfeld, but all Afrikaner nationalists explain the Cape's poverty and say, well, look at these poor Afrikaners, or kind of, you know, early Afrikaners. Um, Dutch, 
And actually, it's a miracle, right? The 20th century is a story of these dirt poor people pulling themselves up by their bootstraps. They are lost, they are, there's no identity, they just kind of survive. Uh, the majority simply existed, the isolation of the farms exacerbated the situation. There's no history for them, there's no future. And then by the 19th, late 19th, especially the 20th century, they start gaining economic power. And really the 20th century is a story about Afrikaner emancipation almost, right? So that's, that's the story that they, they tell. Uh, it also, this poverty of the Afrikaner also suited English liberal historians, right? So yes, Alistair Sparks, the mind of the Afrikaner was shaped during the six generations they were lost in Africa. A people who missed the momentous developments of 18th century Europe, a people who spent that time instead in deep solitude, which, if anything, took them back to an even more elementary existence than in 17th century Europe, their forebearers had left. A people who became surely the simplest and most backward fragment of Western civilization. So that's pretty, uh, not a very generous description, I would say. Um, so this, the, the way we tell history matters for today, right? because it kind of shapes our, our worldview. Um, and so that's partly why I think it's, it's important. Not only obviously kind of 18th century history, a lot of the work that I do now is on um, 19th century uh, company records. I show how women, for example, invested in companies more than we suspected. I do a lot of work on one of my students, for example, is working on um, uh, bridal pregnancy in Cape Town in the early 20th century. Um, so we're looking at like hanging and records, matching marriages and baptisms, and just showing basically she says like her dissertation in one sentence is your kind of grandmother was more promiscuous than you thought to her. <laughs> <laughs> so all of these things matter, right? We we tell the way we tell history, we think the past was such kind of a serene and kind of idealistic place, but actually they we, we find that it's that it's far more interesting and demands. Okay, so back to the 18th century. So what I did is I used these probates, um, these inventories. Yeah. Probate. What, what does that mean? Probate. It's so the, the meaning of the word I'm not entirely sure about. It's a, it's a list of assets when people die. That's the easiest way I can uh, explain. So it lists all your when someone died on a farm, people would get the neighbors would come if it was far, or a clerk from Clark from Cape Town would come, and they would kind of assess and kind of make an inventory of all the, all, all the assets. Um, and so we've got a list of assets. So it's, 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 it's an important question in the sense that it's about wealth, right? So this is asset. These are assets that people own. It's, and that's distinct from income. So it's a, you know, now kind of the economics jargon, but it's like a stock variable versus flow variable. Right? So that's important. Okay, um, so what I did for, the, for my PhD was to look at these two and a half thousand images. And um, from the MOOC 8 records, um, I'm sure you've heard of, of them before, and also added several dozen sun washing entries, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So who, who's included in these? So whenever you start thinking about sources, and especially these kind of big databases, you need to think about who's, who's in them and who's not in them. Um, and, and so we economists, again, speak, we think about selection effects. So are we, not, are we only selecting the rich? So if I tell you this is a really rich colony, then you say, well, my records obviously only record the rich, so you would find that it's only the rich, right? Um, and, and I've done a lot of work making sure that you know, we try and cover as many people here as possible. Now, actually, I can quite convincingly say, for many reasons that we do cover, it's a really good representative sample. If anything, we are excluding all the rich. And that's where the Stanimar sample gets kind of interesting, because uh, basically everyone had to have like um, some kind of probate filled in if you didn't have a testament. So the stone washing entries actually are mostly like testaments um, that are recorded. And so you can see the stone wash, not because stone wash was necessarily purification richer, but just these people have a lot more assets than the people in the, in the province. The yeah. uh, testament would be will, yes? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, yeah. Um, good. Um, and so you also find a lot of probates where there are people with incredibly few assets. Basically the clothes on, on them, that's what they got. That's it, and maybe like a trunk or a horse or something, but that's it. That's, so it's not that the poor were excluded from them. Um, but on average, actually, when you go through these lists, um, they're available for free now, so I really recommend you going through them. It's, um, it's actually quite incredible what these people own. 
Um, and so I looked at 28 different products, um, and I'm not going to list all of them, but most, mostly they are the major assets that people have. So slaves being the most important, right? So the most important commodity, given the time, right, were asset, were uh, enslaved people. And then we look at other kinds of uh, assets, um, cattle, uh, horses, sheep, and then productive assets like plows, corn seeds, uh, buckets, spades, guns, uh, brand new store wagons, household assets, things like bed sticks. Um, uh, someone asked about a bed, it's a card, or was the kind of word that we, that we used there. Antonia corrected, so I made, like, this was published, and then afterwards Antonia corrected the thing that I had a, a different interpretation. So I looked at Stuffen, and I thought, you know, in Afrikaans, Stuff, so it's an oven. Um, but then it turns out that it's something you put in your feet to warm it, so it's, it's not entirely. <laughs> Uh, it's not entirely correct, um, but we all learn. Um, luckily, you weren't a referee, or unfortunately, you weren't a referee on paper. Um, and then also, kind of uh, quite um, uh, luxurious assets like paintings and timepieces and these kinds of things. You also have to be cautious. Yeah. So, when I looked at um, uh, trousers, something weird happened. I found that poor people have more trousers than rich people. Right. So, so this seems to have come completely counterintuitive. Why would that be? Now I'm thinking, like, why? How do we? Any thoughts? Why would that be? Why would poor people have more trousers than rich people? It's unfortunately a incredibly boring explanation. But it's because when someone would go to a poor person. There's not a lot of assets, so they would actually count the trousers. They would say seven trousers or four trousers, whatever. But going to a rich person, they would say just a cupboard, cupboard full of clothes. Oh. So you don't actually count the trousers, and so it looks like rich people don't have any trousers. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is, this is the problem with an algorithm, right? It's that you have to think very carefully uh, when you design these things. On aggregate, though, I think I capture uh, kind of a, a good basket of goods that, that people would have owned. Um, and this is just kind of showing you over time the number of, of the inventory. So, so very few initially during the first couple of years there, and then that increases over time. There's also a lot of duplicates. And this is because CAP expands, and so first he would have a, uh, a neighbor um, assessing all the goods, and the kind of paper would be sent to Cape Town, and that would be rewritten. And so there's actually two copies that exist. And I think Elena is using this, or she has used it, to look at how Afrikaans, the language, kind of developed over time, uh, which I think is fascinating stuff. And I think there's also more work to be done, like using new machine learning kind of techniques to, to actually assess how that, that works. Okay, so just to kind of show you, you know, how important were these 20, 28 products. Um, so you'll see it's 25%, basically 24% of all asset wealth that they came was in people, in slaves, right? Um, slave people, then property, cattle, sheep, all the other kinds of assets, and those 30% is the things that I didn't count. So I count about 70% of the uh, asset basket, which I think is pretty fair, right? To get the marginal gains of adding another product is like just too much to, or it's not large enough to, to justify going on. Um, the nice thing, how do I get here? Because I've only got quantities in the probates, I then use the uh, uh, roller, the uh, auction models. The first five volumes when I did this were transcribed, so I could use them to get prices for each of these individual commodities. Right? Um, and then that gives me, allows me to kind of count the basket, the value of something. Um, not to kind of um, you know, labor too long on this point. So this just table gives you the averages. So basically, how affluent were these sectors? This is the result. On average, a settler owns five enslaved people, 54 cattle, six horses, 350 sheep, 1.2 wagons, 10 chairs, 4.5 paintings. So when I showed this to my Dutch um, supervisor, he started laughing. He said, John, you've got the algorithm wrong. Go back. And so I spent like three months counting these things, so I could literally tell people, what, the, what, do, what do you do for your PhD when I'm counting sheep? Because it took me about two weeks to, it took me two weeks to count the sheep. But he said this is impossible, because a rich person in Holland at that time owned at maximum 25 head of cattle. 
a rich person. Here, yeah, what you're telling me is that the average person owns 54 head of cattle. Right, so these cattle are not exactly the same. It's not the cattle of the, but still, 54 is a lot. 350 sheep, that's a lot of sheep. Um, and uh, and even now, 10 chairs. I mean, I don't have 10 chairs in my house at the moment. Right? <laughs> tells you maybe more about my house than anything. <laughs> but, but I don't. So 10 chairs is a lot for the average individual um, at the Cape to have 10 chairs suggests that this is not just an economy where there are a few that are super rich and everyone else is poor. Um, yes? Sorry. Is this over a, a particular time or over a number? Yeah, excellent question. Sorry, I should, have, I should have said this. So this is an aggregate figure for this entire period. So this is from basically 1700. I think the, the first observation is like 1697 to 1795. So I stopped in uh, to actually 1806. So I stopped in 1806. Um, yeah. So it's all of them combined. Um, it's too difficult to do it. I mean, I, I, you can do it over time, but it kind of stays flat. It's, it's high from the start. Um, rises slightly. Yeah. The, the land doesn't play a role here. The land of the house. I don't have any estimates for land size or land value. The estimate that I have here for property, I don't trust this too much because properties aren't always in, in the probates that are typically included, but they're not always included. So I feel I'm to kind of make an, a general case about the average size of a farm or the average size of a house. Uh, maybe that you can do that, but I, I'd be hesitant to do that. So that would have an influence on how many chairs, for instance. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, but I would like to say that the, the average the number of chairs, for example, is a rough <laughs> reflection of the size of the house. But, but we don't, I just don't trust the kind of the size of the properties that are listed here, because I don't think people always report the properties. Um, yeah. So, if you just compare Holland then and South Africa, the results in more space in South Africa, so you can have bigger properties than you could run. Therefore, more cattle. Like, could a little Dutch farm have 54 cattle? No, they couldn't, no, yeah. And the other thing is, slaves and having slaves, that was probably, I'm imagining, not the norm in Holland at that time. No. So actually having a country where slavery is normal, those with developing agriculture, kind of colonizing it, etc., etc. So in a way, is it really fair to make comparisons because there's such different scenarios? Um, so if slaves were the biggest asset, but there were no slaves in Holland, how hmm. do you compare? It's an excellent point. So the, the point about slavery, do you mind if I just speak without it? Is that fine? Yeah. No, it's fine. Okay. Uh, the point about slavery is that, sorry, I'll get to it at the end, um, because I'm going to say something about slavery and what the implications are for economic development uh, in terms of slavery. The point about the comparison with Holland, I do three comparisons. I do a comparison with, uh, with Holland, with England, and with the Chesapeake in America. So Chesapeake is obviously a, a bit more, exactly. Um, I do England and Holland because that's the origin of the, the, of the settlers, basically, later settlers as well. Sorry, um, um, they're recording. Ah, you're recording it. Ah, okay, let's do it then. <laughs> Sorry, let's just put this in there. Sorry, yeah. yeah, I didn't know this. <laughs> So, so I'll get back to the slavery question, but the comparison, I think, is... Just yeah. one more question. Did they have banks in Holland? Did people have money in banks? Did they have assets that weren't physical things? Yeah, they, they would have, but not as to the... To, I mean, they would have had shares, for example, in the Dutch East India Company. Yeah. Uh, they would have been, but not... I mean, that wouldn't have been something that's uh, necessarily um, uh, all the way down the income distribution. Not everyone would have had that. But, uh, yeah. That, that certainly those things will exist. Also, obviously, yeah, so I didn't count physical currency or um, those kind of things, but, but it's also people here. I'll say something about credit records, for example, a bit later. But yeah. When did, when did Chinese deeds come in? When did recording of land transactions? From the start. So, from the start, there's title deeds. So, there's a different data set that records these things, but land size is never recorded. So, it's like the title deeds. Um, so, we have we're exploring this. We have a map, uh, we have maps of, of the farm, so we could measure the farm size um, at certain points in time. And we've tried to do this. Um, uh, there's also there's, there's 
the thing to know is that there's two dis there are two distinct land regimes, right? There's the one basically this side of the mountains and the one beyond the mountains. This side of the mountains you own the land, it's like titled to it, and the other side you rent the land from, from the company from the company. Um, and so those two give rise to many different types of institutions. On this side, people are incentivized to invest, to build big properties and to you know plant wheat and wine. On the other side, because you rent uh, you have bigger farms, I mean, also this kind of geography is different, but you have bigger farms, it's more pastoral. Um, so, yeah, so, but it's also there the distinction often from the historians of being rich, rich Cape Peninsula and Stellenbosch area, poor interior. And like the records that I have shows that, you know, there, there's quite a lot of rich people beyond the mountains as well. So it's not, one shouldn't, that distinction is not that actually clear. Um, not saying that the previous historians were wrong, there's also a lot of poor people, but on average, these these people are not desperately poor. If they were desperately poor, if you're desperate, and this is the kind of thing that I tell the students often, it's like if you're desperately poor, you're not gonna you're not gonna see a lot of people migrate here. Right? But people come, right? So um, there's an attraction. Um, so there's a new book out also on um, on the Huguenots that you've got you're gonna miss out to the uh, a Global Refuge, I think it's called. It's a 2020 book. Um, and it's really wonderful. I tell you, I mean, it's a really wonderful book about the French Huguenots. And the Cape actually features quite, quite prominently in this. Um, and it's telling about these stories about why the Huguenots come. Right? And it's, it's attractive because they, um, there's this kind of land with opportunity. And you have, you know, um, it's, not so, it's not so great in France. So, um, so um, people vote with their feet. And I think we often forget that. Also, into the interior. People move into the interior because it's attractive. You can make money. Um, yeah. There's a question. I think that's okay. Can we hold the questions? Yeah, cool. Exactly. Okay. Um, how do I know that these records? So I've, oh, I've told, now I tell you that there's a lot of people. You know, there's a lot of wealth, right? How do I know that, um, that these numbers are accurate? I can look at a very different source. So you you won't be able to see the numbers here. But I can look at a very different source, which is the tax census. So these are, this is an amazing source. It's a, every year there's basically a census of the entire economy. It never happens anywhere else in the world that for 140 years, 150 years, there's basically an annual census. Um, and so we started six years ago a project to, to transcribe these censuses. I thought it would take two years, but not even halfway in six years. It's just incredibly expensive and time consuming. But it tells you the name of each Farmer, uh, 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 um, wife's name, a lot of household characteristics, a lot of the labor on the farm, and all the cattle, sheep, horses, and then also like um, wheat, barley, rye, oats, um, sowed and harvested. So it's, it's really an immense deficit and wine as well. So we can compare, what I do here is to just compare the average things that are that are similar. So we have slaves and cattle and sheep in the probates, and we have slaves, sheep, and cattle in the, in, in the, in the tax censuses. And so I can compare. When I look at slaves, they are exactly the same. So um, um, to the extent they're similar, that I was almost frightened to kind of show this because it, it looked too similar. It's like, even if you look at the distribution, they look incredibly similar. So that, that to me felt like, wow, this is, this is amazing. Uh, which it is. So, I mean, I, that, that's why I feel like I can believe the progress. The interesting thing, I think, is that when you look at cattle and sheep, they are not the same. So when you look at slaves, and remember, slaves are not taxed. So, so there's no reason to unreport slaves. <laughs> but, when you, but when you look at cattle and sheep, you see immense differences. Um, and so clearly evidence of massive underreporting of cattle and sheep. In. So once someone dies, obviously there's no reason to underreport. So then they actually report the exact numbers. So the probates are more believable than the tax censuses, where cattle and, uh, cattle and sheep are uh, significantly underreported. Under um, so there's about 80%, right? So it's about half, no, it's more, yeah, it's about half that people report the, the actual numbers um, already back then. Uh, okay, so was the Cape poor? I would say you're comparing to Holland, England, and Chesapeake. It's kind of difficult to find comparable records, or there's all kinds of permutations. Um, I won't bore you with the details. What often is reported, not how many assets someone owns, but whether they own an asset in these places, which also tells you that it's 
They just want to know whether someone has books. Like I actually can count the number of books uh, of them. Although, the, again, there is also a footnote saying often they don't they don't count the number of books. They just say but they book them or some books. Right? So you don't actually know whether it's like five or fifty. Um, but in America, for example, they just report whether someone has a book. And the campus just far exceeds the number of books, again, on like frequency of, of, of having a book than in America. Um, even you know, the number of Bibles, these kind of things, or just um, paintings. Um, the Cape is actually comparable to like similar records in London. London and Kent is kind of higher than the Cape. But, but even in Amsterdam, Amsterdam and Probate and Jews are fewer lessons than the um, Cape centers. So in that sense, I, I'm kind of uh, quite confident that these numbers reflect a society that is pretty affluent. That is not to say that it's not incredibly unequal, right? So that is that is still true. So I agree with the historians that there is massive inequality, and we can measure this inequality, especially in the what we now transcribing these tax censuses. You can see, and I'm talking not even if you just zoom in on the settler population. There's massive inequality. And if you add the slave and slave people, if you add the Western population, obviously that inequality even increases even further. Um, we've recently, even just kind of as an aside, we've recently started digitizing some of these. What we've discovered in the Cape Archives, are, there are tax censuses for Kwe um, villages and, and, and settlements. And so this is really fascinating. We can actually look at also inequality within Kwe society, which we couldn't before. Basically, any other uh, indigenous records, any place in the world, are typically they just assume that incomes are similar. So they assume a kind of homogenous income. Um, and that's simply you know, the, that's a, a bit of a ridiculous assumption. And so when we look at poor society, it's also incredibly unequal. So it's, one should just think of pre industrial societies as being very, very unequal. Um, and I think that's something that's often we have again this utopian view of the past. Everyone living happily in their kind of um, you know poverty, but you know romantic idea that, that this was some kind of um, a wholesome, good, nice place to live. And I think if you if you look at these kind of records and you see the massive levels of inequality, then then certainly that you, you kind of doubt those those uh, those ideas. Um, so why do we believe that the cat was poor? Apart from the fact that you know, it suits our myths about the past, it's also because. A lot of the historical sources, and this is, I think, something that I, I want to urge my historian colleagues to kind of look at more carefully. Is historical sources, when you're a traveler, uh, so historical sources rely often of, of kind of on, on narratives, right? About so traveler accounts, reports, letters from settlers. If you think about who are writing these letters, when you write a letter to um, today to the newspaper. Is that a fair reflection of society? The view of, of so, so people complain about certain things. Is that a, is that actual reality, or is it just like reporting what's happening on the on the outliers, on the extremes? If a traveller moves into South Africa now and they report back, do they report the average condition, or do they report the extremes? And the same is true for back then. When, when travellers moved into the interior, they would often report, oh, the desperate poverty of the frontier farmer. And it's not to deny that they weren't poor frontier farmers. But they obviously would not really reflect on the average wealth that they would, they would reflect on the most extreme uh, observations that they would see. And so this is where I think the, the contribution that we make is to say, let's look at the quantitative history, let's look at the, uh, the descriptive analysis of aggregate statistical patterns and compare that to the narrative. And then we see, well, perhaps, perhaps it's similar, and then, okay, then we can confirm. But perhaps there are discrepancies. And I think this is what our research, or this research kind of pointed to, is that perhaps we should be more careful um, in, in assessing this. Okay, so I've told you there's a lot of wealth. Is there any other con kind of evidence to support this? So you always need more evidence and more evidence because now you're also creating enemies, right? You, you, you've kind of, you, there's this young guy who's just said, well, all the previous historians have been wrong. Um, that's not the way to make friends, and so we started with a big, a big program to kind of get more evidence. So one of my, um, one of my former PhD students, Jean Solier, um, uncovered, or she actually approached uh, 
what was then the genealogical Institute of South Africa. Got a big database of genealogical records, again, of these set of farmers, uh, farmers for the first two centuries. And she just started calculating longevity. No one seems to have used this and done this before. So you can actually obviously calculate life, life duration or longevity, how long people live. And you compare that again to England and Holland. And you find people live much longer, not much longer, but they live longer at the head than they live back in, in Holland. Um, so again, that supports if, you're, if you've got more income, if you've got more access to a better diet, which you can say they've certainly had than, than in, in Holland, then on aggregate, even, even though there might be a greater kind of risk of uh, dying at, and I think we'll talk about that tomorrow morning, <laughs> might be a greater risk of dying at your childbirth or these kind of things, but still on aggregate, uh, people live longer. Uh, with my uh, supervisor, I calculated a GDP measure, and so we can calculate for 300 years, um, from 1700 to basically 2010, and we can kind of show that these sectors on aggregate during the 18th century were certainly much more affluent on a per capita basis than, than England and Holland, um, and basically that reverses in the 19th century, so beginning of the 19th century, you kind of see the uh, change. Even if you add enslaved people and Khoisan people to this, right? so you have to make very strong assumptions about this, but then GDP levels are slightly below in the so it's still quite an affluent society uh, if those uh, groups are, are added. And then finally, I think the most interesting work is with also a former PhD student that's now at, at, um, at the University of Western Cape. Um, we, we look at these, so I never looked at the financial transactions in the probates, but these are, they're just like everywhere. Like the number of credit and debt transactions between, um, between different individuals. So she looked at this, and there's again, like uh, the historiography suggests that, you know, it's only the poor that, because of desperation, um, had to go into debt. And actually, if you look at the numbers, well, there are a lot of poor people that go into debt, but there's far more rich people that go into debt. And, they don't, and you can actually see what they use it for, because they say, this loan was for this. this. And you can actually see that it's not for consumption. It's not that they, they're incurring debt to buy you know, household goods that they need now to survive. They're buying it to invest. Often they invest in slaves. But they're buying it for productive purposes, right? not for consumption purposes. So kind of, that, again, Cast a doubt on this idea that it's like a poor backward society where there's no, you know, it's not a pre capitalist, often the word that's used, um, where people just make out of desperation they're going to death. And that's certainly not the case. Um, it's, it's a far more um, informal, that's true, it's not a formal, there's no formal banking system, a formal, uh, informal system, an elaborate financial system. Um, last two slides. What is the source of this world? And I mean, we can talk about this um, for a long time, um, so for, for about both of these slides, but um, let me just say, you know, as an economist, you've got a demand side and a supply side. The demand side, it's the fact that the cable has got to sketch and market the ships, right? So the ships have to come, and we forget that, that this is a massive market. These ships really don't have an alternative, right? There's some alternatives, but they really don't. So about 6,000 soldiers and sailors stop every year in Cape Town. Um, and that's a massive market if you're producing wheat, if you're producing wine, and if you're producing uh, meat. And um, so these, this, you sell it to the company, but there's a market for the company goods. And so, um, as more, you know, if, if there's a demand, then there will be obviously people producing. On the supply side, cheap land makes it much easier, right? So cheap land is acquired through con conquest initially, but mostly through disease. Right, so 1713, smallpox, these kind of things, really decimate the poison population and makes it much easier for settlers to kind of move in beyond the mountains. Um, um, and basically, Khoisan are either forced to flee or they are forced to uh, join the colonial economy as laborers. Um, so I've got cheap labor in there. I, I, my view on slavery at the Cape is also a long discussion, but I don't think slaves in this sense are cheap labor. So I, I would be cautious to say slaves have a different purpose. And this is something that historians I don't think have, have emphasized enough. Given these incredibly detailed financial records, and given what we now know about like early 19th century, working on a big project on emancipation and the mortgage rolls, slaves are 
useful labor, but they're primarily useful collateral. Um, and so I think that is something that really is not being highlighted um, at, at the Cape. So before a formal banking system, you cannot sell your land often. I've mentioned land in the interior. So land is not a liquid asset. What is a liquid asset? Slaves. Slaves are liquid. And this is actually building on very recent work that's happening in the US where they basically show exactly the same thing. Um, so I think that's something to explore further. And then I've got a paper where we show how the uh, winemaking skills of the units. So we basically take the units that come down, we look at units from wine producing regions, units from wine, non wine producing regions in France. So presumably the units from wine producing regions know a little bit about making wine. They come to the Cape and we can clearly show the ones that know how to make wine actually do make really good wine. Oh, good wine at that time was basically wine that would last longer than three months. Um, so that's so it's not good wine in the sense that it tastes nice, but it's just wine that you could actually sell to a shop cap. Um, so so the skills also matter. And the kind of interesting thing about our research is to show that you would think that the skills matter initially, and then as the you know it's kind of integrate into society, this, these skills disappear, the skill gap disappears. But actually the skill gap increases. So we're kind of thinking of why this would be and We've got some tentative ideas about that. Why is actually really difficult to making wine is really difficult to learn. Um, so um, there, there are ways, there are interesting strategies that, that some of these Dutch farmers are using to acquire these skills. So they're marrying the French United wife, for example, to to make better wine. Um, but that's a long story. Right? <laughs> um, what's what's next? So um, I've mentioned that we're working on this. Uh, Big transcription project on the Hochhaufroller. You can go to the CAD panel website where we, we're building. We're just we are this week writing a, a major funding application. If this is successful, this will be uh, incredible with, with the Swedish uh, bank. So hopefully that comes comes off. Um, and then we can expand this um, to do also all of these quests and records that we, that we hope to do. Uh, part of that would also be to work on the auction rules. Um, and the really wonderful thing about the auction, something that you know, economists are kind of now getting into, but economic historians really haven't, is studying these, although, you know, Nile Ferguson has got a book on this, but, but networks, I think, are really fascinating to study. So who, we, how do you get, how do you get wealthy if you're a poor settler, young poor settler? And we've got all these kind of theories about, you know, human capital being important and, you know, marrying into a rich, uh, you know, wife or husband, whatever. But I think a lot of it's to do with networks. And so we want to use these auction rules to see who appears at these, you know, who are the, the middle person that go to all these auctions that buy the right kind of goods, that interact with the right type of people, and in that way build up, uh, build themselves up and kind of become socially mobile. So that's something that we want to investigate. And then finally, I've mentioned to you uh, something about the, the slave emancipation project. Um, uh, they will actually, I should have put the website here, it's, it's called unchartedpeople.org. So we've got a big project where we, um, we've got five themes and one of the themes looks at um, slavery. Um, and and you know, I've got a PhD student looking at the mobility of slaves beyond in the, 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 the emancipation period. But also just, this is a fascinating period by itself, this 1830s. So you've got this massive informal, I'll end with this, we've got this massive informal network, financial network, right? Of, of this kind of across the entire economy, people owning slaves. Yes, the slaves work on the farms, and it's, you know, it's a slave system, so it's, you know, treatment is terrible. But the ultimate aim really is as, as a form of collateral for these farmers. Because there's no formal banking system. So if, you, if you make a surplus, what do you do if you're in a, in a slave environment? The only thing to do is to invest more in slavery. Right? So that's the kind of incentives. Actually, Adam Smith, to get back to the first point, Adam Smith actually said this in his Wealth of Nations. He said that. The thing with slavery is that it, it builds a kind of prosperous society, but with no dynamism. So it's a hybrid term, so that's the kind of point of the, of the talk. Is that it's, you kind of reach a level of wealth that is very high, but there's no incentive to innovate and invest in new technologies. Because the only thing you can do is really acquire more, slave, more slaves. Um, and so that's, you know, if you want to ultimately step back and say, why did the Cape, given that it was so wealthy, wealthier even perhaps to, to most people than England, England experiences the Industrial Revolution, not, not the Cape. Why? Well, you might say, well, scale is different. 
but it's also because the Cape is a slave society, and all the incentives then are aligned not to invest in new technologies that replace labor, but it's actually to kind of augment the existing system of slavery, to add to it, to, um, to reproduce it. Um, and so that's really why if you, if you are in a slave system, you're kind of stuck in it. Um, and so when we look at the 1830s period, remember the 1830, 1834, it's kind of a shock to the system because it comes from the outside, this British parliament that decides that you know, emancipation should end. Cap farmers are super unhappy with this. Um, they are compensated though, so this is also something that we are really interesting, uh, studied, uh, interested in studying. Um, but what happens? In the 1830s, you see the rise of banks. There are some banks before that, but it's really only in the 80, late 1830s, 1840s, that you see the formalization of the financial system. So the kind of ultimate kind of shift happens from an informal system basically relying on slavery to a formalized system where you have no banks an expansion of the, uh, what we today think of like a, the capital, uh, capital markets. Um, so that's really where we are now. And these are the questions. Thank you very much. Hi. You talk about the captive market of about 6,000 people a year coming through the cap. I'm surprised that figure's so low. Um, um, given that it is a compulsory stock. Um, I, what, what is that, uh, how does that compare with the total population in the Cape at that time? So, the, uh, so it's a good question. So obviously the, it varies, but it's roughly 6,000, right? So, and initially, it's, it's massive. So in the, in the 17th century, there's, you know, from 300 people to maybe 1,000 people. Um, so that's that. that kind of, um, those numbers are really important. Later on, obviously, it becomes a smaller part of the of the. Um, but also, shipping shipping expands a little bit, not not too much, but um, um, so it becomes a smaller and smaller part, basically, the captured market. But without that initial market, it wouldn't have existed. The cash wouldn't have existed. But is that basically cash prisoners? Uh, no. So this is well, um, depends on what you mean with cash prisoners. They're only allowed to sell, obviously. From the company, um, so the farmers sell to the, to the company, and then the company uh, profit sells to the ships. Uh, it stays here, it doesn't go to shares in uh, It depends on who the ships are. If it's the Dutch East India Company ships, I mean, I don't, I don't know exactly how the money flows, but there's a, um, but if it's foreign ships, they sell at massively inflated prices. Okay. Um, thank you. I'll, I'll move from this way and then that way up. I was just curious what happens if you use the medium instead of the average? Yeah, it, it's, it's a good question. It's, um, it's not that there are massive outliers on the, at the top. So it actually doesn't change, the medium doesn't change it too much. Um, although if you go back, I do think I've added the medium here. So some of them, um, you do find, like, you'll see this is actually, you, know, you, you won't be able to see it, but there's actually a column here that says, the percentage of zero. So if you're more than 50 percent zero, the median is just going to be zero. So yes, there are. Uh, this this is the kind of high level of inequality um, that we find. Um, but um, the the kind of interesting thing is is that if it's difficult to actually um, construct a wealth index because the rich person that I would think would own all of the things doesn't actually own all of the things. So someone would have a lot of chairs and some paintings, but not some of the other things. So the so the um, so it's not it's it's not that there's like ten people that own everything and kind of the rest own nothing. Um, it's, it's a terrible way of explaining it, but the. Not, not this, the, the rich doesn't own all of the stuff in the in the sense that they own all of the types of goods that are available. So I try to choose things also like fishing boats or so. So if you own a fishing boat, it's actually unlikely that you'll own many of the other kind of things. Um, that's that's really the um, yeah the point. Three questions. I'm interested in why slaves were not taxed. You mentioned that, and then the and you also mentioned the website for slave in I think you said Uncharted Uncharted That's our project. So the second, uh, the first two questions, I don't know why slaves want tax, but it wouldn't make sense for the company to tax the input, right? So they want to tax the outputs, so cattle and, and of production. 
So you don't want to tax. You don't want to prevent someone from actually starting up. You want to, you know, you want to tax the things that they're producing. So that's the only thing I can think of. Um, it wouldn't make sense to, to tax inputs. It's like taxing a, a you know, brandy store or something. It wouldn't. Um, uh, and the, yes, all the tax censuses are the Opgaf rolle is like a massive series of tax censuses. I mean, we've started doing Grafenet, we've started Tilbach, and we've got Stellenbosch from 1780, and they should now actually be given it back to the to the archives in printed form. They want to be in printed form. So, but we'll at some stage start releasing some of this on our website, um, so that you can actually just download it. Makes sense. Yeah. What is the value system for valuing the slaves? Oh, um, auctions. So it's a market price. Um, it's what, what someone is willing to pay. It's a fascinating thing for me as an economist is to see, to look at the kind of the variation of prices, not only of slaves but of all goods. So you would have, I would think, like if you've got a horse, you know, it's, you know a horse is like 20 rex dollars or whatever, then most horses would be around 20 rex dollars. You actually find that like, sometimes like, at the same auction with have a horse selling for like 70 rex dollars and another one selling for five. So just this massive, it's actually finding the average of price is really tricky because it's, it just varies quite a lot. And the slave prices, so the slave prices we have in here for the emancipation laws, that's also really interesting because it seems, I couldn't find any story actually writing about how this process exactly worked. So what I know now is that these, uh, and Spatian was announced at the end of like December, I think, 1830, I want to say 1833, 1834. And uh, you've got these commissioners going into the countryside, and they are supposed to use historical auctions of the previous seven years or so to assess slaves. So they must check whether this person exists. They give some particulars, sometimes they give age, sometimes they give um, uh, occupation, sometimes they give origin, and then the owner's name. And then they're supposed to give a sign based on previous valuations a value. And we've done a lot of work on trying to see. I told Antonia, like, one of the really fascinating things that we found is that calendar names. So if you've got a surname like, or a name like September or October or April or whatever, um, these are somehow conditional on all other observable characteristics, they are lower value. So we don't know why. Um, and no historian is able to tell us why this would be. Um, so this is really fascinating. And so her project would be to look at does this actually play a role in their future mobility? So, you know, if you, if these names somehow are assessed to be of like lower value, does that make a difference later on in life? Um, we don't know yet. But we'll, we'll, uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, I find it fascinating using the economic methods to with this historical material. But part of the difficulty, on the other hand, is that. And notions such as wealth were historically contingent. So you, if, what you see as wealth now um, may be completely different to how they perceived wealth in the 18th century. So how do you pull together the, 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 the different meanings of wealth and the way in the, the fact that often what people were being evaluated was, was also prejudice about class and, and um, those kind of ideas as to whether people were actually wealthy. So people would travel through and they would often acknowledge that they did have lots of things, but they were like uncivilized. Mm. You know? So how do you pull together all those yeah. So that's a long answer, um, and, and I don't think there's, um, there's one view on this. I think there are, if, you, if you're an economic historian, you want to use some measures that are that are consistent across time, right? So, so GDP perhaps is not the best one for that, but like longevity is. So you always, you know, it's very difficult to imagine a period in time when people didn't want to live longer. Um, we also, I use a lot of height data. So height is a rough reflection of people's living standards. To give you a very, very, I mean, uh, first response is no, this cannot be. But to give you a good sense, in 1960, South and North Koreans were on the same height. Today, South Koreans is 8 centimeters taller than North Koreans. So height varies massively across time. And so you can use heights. And height, is, you know, this is consistent. So you can use that. Um, I would also say that um, I, I need to be cautious in saying that this is one measure of. So you might say, you know, a good life is a life where you can go to the opera. Oh, Cape never had an opera, so it's better to live in Amsterdam. And that might be true, right? So, so there's many th things to having a good life. What we are measuring here is very simply kind of access to certain types of assets. How, what the normative implications of that would be, 
I would be, I am an economist, I'm not going to kind of say this is better or worse. I'm just saying the kind of positive outlook would be, um, compared to normative, would be these guys have more and these guys have less. But that's, that's really the best I, should, I can do. Um, there was a question. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Uh, I'm very interested in your uh, observation that uh, slave owning society tends to become stagnant economically. And I wondered if there wasn't another important comment.